Welcome everybody to the ActDev Network Clubhouse call on Wednesday, June the 2nd, noon Eastern Standard Time, 12.05 actually. Uh, my name is Dan Taylor and I co-host the show with Lara Fritz and Bob Minhas. And today we are talking about site selection and we have an expert in Chris Lloyd. So looking forward to that. For those who don't know me, I am the Economic Development Catalyst for the Town of Innisfil, and I'm also a Strategic Advisor and Guide to those in the Economic Development profession, primarily helping people with uh, co-creating strategic plans, which basically means it's not a cookie-cutter approach, and I do a lot of other things as well. But for now, why don't I turn it over to Bob and kick off the show. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. And thank you, Lara. I'm, I'm going to give some credit where credit is due. Lara was amazing at organizing this particular session today. And so as we start, I'm just going to set the room because I know we've got some usual folks here, but some new folks here joining us as well. My name is Bob Minhas, and as Dan mentioned, I'm the co-host here with him, Dan Taylor and Lara Fritz. You are in the Active Network Clubhouse room. So if you haven't done so already, make sure that you hit the little bell on top of the Active Network session. Um, name because that'll notify you when we have future events and you definitely don't want to miss out. Uh, if this is your first time here, we do record these sessions. Uh, Dan is amazing at leveraging what we share here in a podcast for those who can't uh, make it uh, to this particular session. The theme today is we're going to talk about site selection for economic developers, which again, for me is exciting because I always love learn something new. Now, if you haven't done so yet, check out our stage. We have two amazing thought leaders, David and Chris, that have joined us today. Be sure to follow them here on Clubhouse, because if they're in other uh, Clubhouse rooms, you want to make sure you get notified when they're their amazing <laughs> as well. For our friends in the audience, if uh, you're new to our Clubhouse room or Clubhouse in general, on the very bottom of the screen, you'll see a hand icon on top of a notepad. If you press that, that's raising your hand to ask a question. So if you want to join in the conversation, question, or maybe you have your own thoughts. We love making this a roundtable discussion. Press that button and that'll allow myself, Lara, or Dan to bring you up on stage. Now, when we do bring you up on stage, your mic does go live. It is what they called hot in the business. So you want to make sure that you hit mute as soon as you land there on the stage. And if you haven't been on a clubhouse stage yet, when you land, uh, there are three things that'll make your stage experience a lot more pleasurable. Number one, if you hear something that you really love, be sure to hit the mute icon on and off super quick, and that'll indicate applause. And if you want to share something, if you hit the mic icon, mic icon slowly, that'll indicate to myself, Dan or Laura, that you have something to share, and we can make sure that uh, you're able to share it. Uh, if you are in the audience or even on stage and you hear some amazing thoughts in this room and think, you know what, amazing, my colleagues would definitely benefit from this. There's a plus sign on the bottom which will allow you to ping uh, or invite uh, other folks to join in the conversation here as well. So be sure to press that. Uh, and if they don't have a Clubhouse invite yet, please make sure to DM myself or Taylor, and we'll be sure to help them get online. Now that Clubhouse is on the Android app, and I'm sure many of us in municipalities know we tend to see more Blackberry than Android devices than iPhones. So we're pretty excited to see that happen. Uh, and if you uh, are interested in uh, keeping up to pace with this particular room, we do host it on Wednesdays and Fridays at 3. There's a bell icon for this room that you can click so you get notified when we have sessions happening. Lara, Dan, I think that's all I have to share. So, Dan, you've done an intro. I want to throw it over to Lara to introduce herself a little bit as well. Well, thanks so much, Bob. And this is always so much fun to get together on Wednesdays and Fridays and talk about economic development. Um, I'm Laura Fritz, and I am a professional economic developer for over 25 years, currently doing consulting for a company called Aspira USA, where we work to assist uh, BIPOC businesses in growing their companies. So a lot of fun. And today I'm so excited to welcome my friend Chris Lloyd to the stage. And Chris has um, decades of experience in site selection and is um, a friend of mine from the Richmond area. So welcome, Chris. I'm excited to have you here today. Great. Thanks, Laura. I'm really excited to be here and thanks for the invitation to be with everyone today. It's um, my first. Uh, experience on clubhouse and i would say that it's the only clubhouse i'll ever get into because my blood is not blue enough to get into the country club of virginia so which laura will understand but uh 
it really is a pleasure to be with you all today. Just I'll, I'll start with a little bit of background about myself um, and then um, I'll walk through um, a little bit about kind of what's going on in the economic development world right now as we're emerging from the COVID pandemic. Um, and then a little bit about my perception as a site selector as to what communities can do to manage some of these trends. Uh, but Laura really did emphasize that it is supposed to be interactive. So I will not turn this into a Shakespearean monologue, uh, but we'll probably talk for 10 to 15 minutes and then uh, really open it up for questions and discussion. Um, and so again, really pleasure to be with you all today. Um, economic development has been my entire professional career. I graduated from William and Mary in 1993 uh, took two weeks um, and then started in the office of the Secretary of Commerce and Trade as an intern in uh, June 1, 1993. Uh, boy, that's been 28 years ago. Um, and uh, have been doing economic development since then. So that was the end of the Wilder administration in uh, Virginia. So I worked for six months for Governor Wilder, then survived transition and worked for George Allen um, all four years as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Trade at 22 years old. So I uh, got to be very active in the creation of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, the modern economic development apparatus in Virginia, and then uh, left, uh, we in Virginia, the last, for those of you not familiar with Virginia, we're the last one-term governor state in Virginia because by God, that's the way Thomas Jefferson did it. So 240 years later, it's the way we're gonna still do it. And, um, so the Allen administration came to an end. I thought I'd already gotten into law school, turned that down, um, thought maybe I'd get my MBA. And I got a call from McGuire Woods, which is the preeminent firm here in Richmond, uh, now a national law firm with 1,200 attorneys all across the world um, to help start their uh, consulting subsidiary. So I lead the uh, economic development uh, and incentives team, technically, technically we're called infrastructure and economic development. Uh, here at McGuire Woods. So most of my colleagues are lobbyists based in Washington or state capitals, uh, but I lead our site selection practice, um, which is principally, uh, just so you're aware, we do not do public work um, or you know, on very rare occasions if we get pulled into it by law firm work uh, or client relationships. But typically we represent 99% uh, of our work is on behalf of clients, uh, private companies uh, in their site selection uh, and incentives negotiation activities. Uh, I still do some lobbying here in Virginia, remain active in uh, public policy issues in Virginia as well as across the country because of that work. Um, and uh, just, you know, from our industry perspective, um, it really falls into four sectors. Um, food and beverage is very large for us, uh, followed by uh, logistics and distribution, um, manufacturing with a particular focus on aviation, and then corporate office, which I include shared service and data center in that. So um, most of our clients, uh, we do a lot, uh, probably about half are overseas based, half of them are domestically uh, based. Um, and our principal focus is in the mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, the Southwest, and the Midwest. Uh, we're starting to do a little bit more work in the Intermountain West, um, very little on the East, I mean, on the West Coast and a little bit in New England. But uh, we only do domestic work. We don't do work on behalf of clients overseas, though we do represent overseas companies in the United States. Um, with that brief overview, kind of uh, I want to run through kind of what is certain, uh, what, what appears to be certain as a result of uh, the COVID crisis, first and foremost. And I, I don't think some of these will be surprised. One, that e-commerce. Uh, and the logistics changes um, and the development that it's spurring is is here to stay. Um, all you need to do is look at a satellite image of what's going on at the ports around the country and you see that they are packed. Uh, in fact, if you go look at LA Long Beach, you see ships uh, parked out in the harbor. Um, uh, and, and we have made the adjustment uh, in, in e-commerce. People thought it was gonna take, particularly for certain sectors like grocery, it was gonna take a decade or longer. That is uh, now happened within a matter of months. Uh, that trend is here to stay. Uh, I don't know that uh, it will maybe be at the level it's been at, um, but it will maybe take a temporary lull, but then it's gonna just continue to resume. That does not mean that retail is dead. Um, I took our daughter, 12 year old to the mall this past weekend and it was plenty crowded, um, but um, e-commerce and, and, and how that's revolutionizing the whole retail experience, the 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 industrial development, I've, I've heard statistics that anywhere from a half a billion to a billion square feet of warehouse space is now under construction in America. Um, and uh, it just continues to, to grow, particularly um, uh, either in the big hub cities, you know, the Chicago's, the Dallas's, the Atlanta, uh, those inland cities, uh, or Denver to some degree. 
um, uh, but also particularly the coastal, the port uh, markets. The, I was just in Savannah two weeks ago. The amount, just look out the window if you fly into Savannah and just look at all the development that's going on out there. Charleston, Norfolk, uh, Jacksonville, Miami, uh, Mobile, Houston, um, uh, Baltimore to a lesser extent. Uh, just the amount of port growth is just absolutely incredible and all to support that. Second, data is hot. Um, data centers are, 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 it's not just in Northern Virginia anymore. Uh, Northern, I mean, uh, the Dallas area, Atlanta, uh, other areas around the country are seeing um, either, uh, either enterprise scale data centers or smaller data centers. Uh, but also uh, given um, the attention coming not only from the Colonial Pipeline and then the JBS hack, uh, cybersecurity is a growing issue. We're seeing that among our cyber clients. They're adding jobs, can't add them fast enough. Um, so that is a big um, uh, area of growth and development. And again, I want to emphasize that is not just in Northern Virginia. With these new international cables that are coming into the East Coast, uh, and as you develop the transcontinental cables to, to link those, uh, to link markets together, uh, any place that has adequate water and power infrastructure can host data centers. Uh, three, what's certain is that people are absolutely leaving high cost states and communities. Uh, the, tech, the state that's seen that the most is Texas, but Arizona as well, uh, Florida and Georgia, and to some degree, North Carolina and South Carolina are seeing that, as well as some other states. But it is, I don't want to say a wholesale evacuation, uh, but the bleed from California um, and other higher cost states um, is significant. Uh, it's driving uh, housing prices uh, crazy. I was in Phoenix a couple of weeks ago talking to someone. Uh, he had recently separated from his wife, was looking for a house in the $250,000 range. He found one. In uh, one afternoon, the house got 67 offers, and the highest um, offer was $112,000 over asking price. Um, it's just unbelievable what's going on in those markets. I'm hearing similar, not as extreme here in the Richmond area, Florida. Uh, property just can't stay on the market fast enough. Um, so people are voting with their feet uh, and leaving some of these higher cost markets. Uh, and finally, uh, people do want, in, um, you know, outdoor experiences, whether it's dining, uh, recreation, or other experiences, and how communities reshape themselves uh, from a street escape perspective, from a pedestrian perspective, from a recreational perspective, uh, and from a business perspective to embrace that. Uh, and year-round outdoor experiences is uh, something that uh, remains to be seen. Uh, what's proven to be a myth, or it looks like it's going to be a myth of, of some prog prognostications uh, at the beginning of COVID uh, that I don't think have come to bear. Uh, first, I think a lot of people were expecting a reshoring boom. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not seeing it, uh, except in very strategic sectors, uh, semiconductors being one, um, where I think there's concerns about technology overseas, and there's, of course, a, a, a huge uh, gap in supply right now. Uh, but this 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 over this wave of companies that was going to reshore to the United States, I'm not seeing it. Uh, there might be some strategic plays here and there, but uh, overall, um, it's not happening. And if it was happening, you wouldn't have 50 ships waiting to get into the ports of LA and Long Beach, uh, delivering product from Vietnam and um, China to the United States. You would instead have that manufacturing coming to the United States. That doesn't mean manufacturing is not strong in the United States. In fact, I think manufacturing is doing well, but uh, this tie to reshoring that everybody thought was going to be uh, this big thing is just not happening. Second, um, while I did say that people are voting with their feet and they're leaving higher cost states, uh, the death of cities, I think, is uh, greatly exaggerated. Um, you know, you see D.C., Chicago, New York, Boston, they're struggling uh, right now. Um, but... Uh, um, you know, the, the office workers have not returned, but I did see something the New York Times said that this weekend, um, you know, attractions are packed, re restaurants are packed, people looking forward to Broadway coming back. Um, you know, I think that, you know, there's going to be some realignment. Uh, but as far as, you know, the death of cities, I, again, I think that's greatly exaggerated. Uh, three factors that I think remain to be, um, remain uncertain still is one, what's the future of the office like? Um, what, what is the size of an office going to be? What's the scope of an office going to be? Is it going to be downtown? Is it going to be in the suburbs? Are people going to have shared spaces? Are they going to have individual spaces? Are people just going to work two or three days a week in the office and two or three days a week at home? What it's going to look like? And I think there's going to be a great variability across professional type, uh, across um, location of where the companies are located. 
uh, some what I'm hearing, uh, particularly for our clients in the D.C. area, is that companies that maybe have had a, a large presence in downtown D.C. will keep some presence in downtown D.C., uh, but we'll now locate a series of satellite offices around the metro area, some in Maryland, some in Virginia, uh, and let people have a shorter commute when they do want to come into the office. I'm hearing that in other places, uh, Atlanta um, and probably New York and Chicago as well. Um, so, again, the future of the office, I think, still remains to be seen. I don't think the office is dead. I don't think downtowns, as I noted earlier, are dead, uh, but it will be different. Um, second, um, there's been a lot of attention given lately to inflation, and it is very real um, because of some of the supply constraints and some of what uh, people are having to pay to get uh, people back to work. I personally think that will abate towards the end of the year, uh, particularly wage inflation, particularly when the on, uh, the additional unemployment insurance um, stipend uh, expires in September. Um, I think some of that pressure on the labor market will decline a little bit, uh, but there are very real uh, supply constraints on steel. Uh, timber and other um, inputs that are driving costs higher and delaying projects. Uh, but I do believe it will be short term uh, unless there's some other shock. Uh, third, I think what remains uncertain is uh, what does tourism look like? Um, you're already seeing, um, you know, the realignment of flights and flight schedules and hotels around the country uh, shifting to resort locations to Florida, to Arizona, to Texas, um, other uh, mountain locations. Um, you know, does this mean the death of the business hotel? I don't think so. Uh, but you're certainly going to see a lot of growth. Tourism growth is already back, if not stronger than it ever was around those kind of resort or vacation destinations. Um, if you're not one of those, what is tourism going to look like for you? Again, remains to be seen. Uh, before I go on to how companies can manage uh, with some of these trends, I'll pause there uh, to see if there are any questions about some of these trends uh, before moving on. Absolutely. I know that we've definitely got questions. Bob, do you want to get us started? For sure. So, Chris, thank you so much for jumping into that. I mean, it, it, it was a really, really great outline of, of sort of where site, site, selector, site selectors are and how they work. And I don't know if I missed this, Chris, so forgive me if it's a duplicate question, but I'm wondering how, um, how what you do is completely impactful for an economic development. I, I know that we have a lot of economic developers who are new entrants into the industry, and so certainly the concept of site selector makes sense, but can you maybe share in your experience why that economic development relationship with you is very powerful for them? Sure. Um, I mean, essentially, thank you, Bob. I appreciate that question. Essentially, um, you know, there are some companies, I'll admit right off the bat, there are some companies that do site selection internally, and some of them do it very well, some of them do it very poorly. Uh, but, you know, those companies that decide that they want an, an I mean, site selection is very complex, uh, mainly because it's the intersection of so many disciplines, the intersection of uh, anyone who's good at economic development site selection understands real estate, they understand environmental regulation, they understand tax, they understand business trends, they understand supply chain, uh, and they understand human resources. They usually have a pretty good basis in law or policy. Uh, accounting, and as I noted earlier, real estate. And so rarely do you find uh, any person um, in-house with a company that kind of uh, has a grasp across that kind of enterprise within a company. Um, and further, you know, a company doesn't do site selection every day unless you're one of the big e-commerce companies uh, that's announcing something every week. Uh, most companies will do a site selection project for a headquarters or a new factory every several years. So why have someone around um, to do that when you can hire a consultant to do that. And that's what the site selection person does. We are essentially the Sherpa uh, to, to help the company um, get through the process of, of determining what their needs are, uh, where might be a good option for them if they're going to expand or relocate, what the potential options are, doing data analysis, doing logistics analysis. Uh, you know, so much of, of what goes on in the relationship of, of, of the work of a site selector, an economic development person doesn't see, uh, because it is helping the client shape the project, uh, understand their own project, understanding what the possibilities are, shaping their experiences uh, or expectations, because they've all read an article in the Wall Street Journal where they saw the Mercedes got $400 million going for Alabama to go into Alabama. And so they walk in the door and say, hey, we're going to add 50 jobs paying 16 bucks an hour and we want $400 million, too. And and just setting that expectations uh, is, is a huge uh, part of the deal. 
um, of, of what a site selector does. So, you know, there's a lot of, again, a lot of activity that goes on behind the scenes. But I think, you know, for someone new in the prof- profession to understand that site selectors are people who are really in the site elimination business. Um, I've never, while I've never had a client come to me and say any of the 12,500 communities in America could serve our site, uh, they do come to us for advice uh, and say, here's my issue, here's my um, activity. You know, what are good communities that might be good hosts for us? So first and foremost, a new economic developer wants to raise awareness of a community with site selectors. And by site selectors, I mean broadly, not only consultants like myself, uh, but also other corporate decision makers. And that is make sure we know that your community exists and what the attributes are of your community. Um, You know, secondly, I think it's 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 being responsive. You know, we are under tight deadlines with our clients um, and we need information. We need it quickly. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis ourselves, but we don't have the on the ground feel. Uh, so we need we need responses very, very quickly. And we need them to be accurate because companies are making uh, significant decisions uh, based on the representations uh, that are being made to them. Um, and third, it's it's being the, being our guide to the community. Um, we uh, had a, a, a meeting with a client last week in South Georgia and we went to them and said, here's what we want to accomplish. You tell us the best way. Who should we be meeting with? Are there neighbors we should be concerned about? What what are what are the pitfalls? And so just having awareness of your own community to guide us, because, again, companies aren't charities. They're they're spending money and creating jobs because they have to, not because they necessarily want to. Uh, So they're looking for someone to provide them solutions, not sales, someone who's going to be willing to be their partner. And the more that you can be that sounding board um, or, or that kind of partner in a process, uh, the better job you as an economic development professional are going to do. Chris, sorry to interject there. That, that's an, I love that. Thank you so much. I kind of wanted, to, if, you're, if you don't mind, I wanted to include David in the conversation as well and, and just see if maybe he has any comments to coincide with what you're sharing. Thank, thank you, Dan. I mean, I'm never going to contradict what Chris has to say. He's obviously an expert in the in in the field, and I think he's he's dead on. The one thing that he really emphasized, and I completely agree with this, and we've always said this, is he's they do the site elimination, and I think that's important for the cities to understand. Is you know, it's it's if you're not up up to to speed, it's easy to eliminate you completely. And I and Chris is one of the best in the business on that. Chris, I do have a question for you. The, the 800-pound gorilla that everybody talks about is labor force and the like. And you were talking about the changes in the office market. Um, how the impact, talked about the impact of the remote worker on site selection, because uh, you're, one of the things I'll tell you what we're trying to do is instead of recruiting a remote worker, we're trying to incentivize your clients to, if you know, if they, if you, let's say if you put a company over in, in, in Dallas, but if you need remote workers, we'll incentivize the company to hire people who live in Wichita Falls to work as a remote worker for them. And so how has that in remote worker uh, impacted you? Right, right. No, I appreciate that question, David. Good to be talking to you. Um, I think, honestly, we're all still trying to figure it out because there's so many issues that come along with that. One is it's not only the incentive issue that you talk about, but then on the back end, it's incentives compliance. <laughs> Um, you know, how does a company track where its employees are? Because so many incentives are tied to location. Um, how do you go about the compliance process? And then how, from the state or local perspective, how do you also ensure compliance? And how do you make sure that your existing rules and regulations don't prohibit a potential for a remote worker or encourage um, a, a remote worker um, a kind of structure? But also that, to be honest and candid, you're not doing something that's stupid. Why would you want as a community to incentivize a company to add workers that uh, I'm just saying, taking back, going back to your example, David, um, going to Dallas, you know, okay, a company says we're going to create 500 jobs, but 450 of them aren't going to be located in Dallas. Well, suddenly that changes the economic equation for Dallas. Um, and, and so comp, because those people are not, li- if they're not living in Dallas and spending money in Dallas and generating income within Dallas, then, then that changes the equation for, for, for Dallas in, in incentivizing the activity. Uh, it's obviously very good for you, David, in Wichita Falls, if you get those remote workers there and they're being paid by someone, you know, a hundred miles away and they those employees are spending in your community, 
but again, again, if you're the, the, the home base or whatever, I, I think there's some very interesting issues that, that people are still grappling with on that. Um, the second issue is, 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 um, you know, what I, I think people are still trying to figure out exactly what remote workers are after. I mean, I think there's, you know, it's quality of life uh, is absolutely essential. It's, it's broadband is absolutely essential. Uh, but beyond that, are the remote workers sticky? Would get, or, or how do you make them sticky? How do you make them stay in your community and not just hop around? Um, you know, that their, their laptop is their office. And, you know, this week it's in Wichita Falls. And next week they're in Omaha. And the following week they're in Jackson Hole. And, or maybe not week by week, but, you know, they, they, they hop around. And so how do you, you um, uh, deal with some of those issues? And, again, make smart um, policy and financial decisions around that from a community's perspective but also the company. How do you still build culture um, and other activities uh, with a remote workforce? I think we're still trying to see how that's going to sort itself out. Very good. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Chris, to that end, what are some of the best practices and incentives um, that are starting to address these kind of questions, which is you know, when an employee isn't home-based with the company's headquarters, let's say in Dallas, what are some of the best practices you're seeing across the country? Um, it's still honestly shaking out, Laura. Um, Colorado pre-pandemic already had developed a, a remote worker program. Um, and I thought pre-pandemic, that was one of the better ones that I'd seen. It's called the Colorado Remote Worker Tax Incentive Program. People can Google it, look it up. Um, since then, right now, I actually thought that in the 2021 legislative session, a lot of states were going to going to start to amend their incentive policies formally to deal with the remote worker. And you've seen a little bit. Virginia passed some legislation that allows remote workers to be counted. Um, you've seen, but it's more been very much ad hoc policies um, where people are granting flexibility with regards to uh, within what they think they have, uh, flexibility within a legal or, or a procedural structure um, to deal with these folks. Honestly, I think, and so I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't more legislation or, or formal policy around this. And it's again, because I don't think people have figured out what the workplace or the workforce or the workplace structure of the future is going to look like. And, and I don't, I, so there aren't, I wish I could say there were, a um, you know, many good practices out there. Again, you know, I think David gave a good example of what his community is doing. But, you know, as far as uh, uh, and I'm, I'm seeing similar, again, ad hoc kind of initiatives um, emerging around the country. But as far as a comprehensive way to deal with this at, you know, at a state level or or that you're seeing widespread adoption, it just hasn't happened yet. And that's because, again, you know, I'm here, I'm sitting in my office in downtown Richmond and there just aren't many people. I mean, most of the state offices are still closed. Most of the offices down here are closed. I don't. I just don't think people know what it's going to look like yet. So, how if you don't even know what people are going to do, where they're going to, you know, where they're.